Um, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us on this second day of an incredibly important symposium. Uh, may I ask those who are sitting further away to come closer to the center. Um, if you are too far to the left, uh, just move towards the center. If you are too far to the right, uh, also do come closer to the center. Thank you, colleagues. So we have a full program today. Um, I will not recap what happened yesterday because I would do a huge injustice to some really thought-provoking and insightful presentations that were made. And those presentations were followed by an equally rich and insightful discussion. Uh, that has been captured and we will revisit it later today. And so we thank those of you who were here yesterday and who participated very actively in the, in the discussions. There were some exciting ideas that were put on the table, great suggestions which certainly will be explored further. Now, of course, we didn't define what we meant by an early career researcher, but implicit in the discussions that we had, it was quite clear that we were looking at students at undergraduate level, starting with undergraduate level, going to postgraduate level, postdoctoral students, but also those who would have recently completed their PhDs, maybe within a period of about five to eight years. And the real point that we are driving at here is to find ways of identifying, supporting, and nurturing those early career researchers. And there are many good reasons why we, sh we should. And one of those is that we do need to regenerate the academy. And we need to contribute to new knowledge Knowledge that advances human understanding and wisdom. Knowledge that contributes to the betterment of the life of the people. And so we are not making any distinction. On the one hand, focusing on having more academics or simply developing researchers for its own sake. They are both equally important and that is the approach that we must continue doing. Now, today's presentations are aimed at sharing various initiatives that are being implemented to develop the capacity of early researchers, or early career researchers. If you look at your program, the first part of this morning, certainly the first hour, is devoted to initiatives that are driven at national level. We'll have a number of presentations which will indicate some of the programs that have been conceptualized and are implemented at a national level. In the second part of the morning's presentations, we will have initiatives that are implemented at institutional level, at university level. Now, the purpose of these presentations is to share experiences and the learnings with a view to identifying those initiatives or aspects that can be scaled and those that can be implemented more broadly. It is vitally important that the proceedings of the two days of this symposium do not just become yet another talk shop. 
we must make sure that the two days that we have spent at the University of Johannesburg translate to concrete plans and concrete action. May I therefore request that as we go through today's program, you jot down two or three recommendations on what needs to be done to advance the common objective of developing, supporting, and nurturing early career researchers. So as we engage throughout the day, do jot down two or three concrete proposals. Later in the day, we'll have an opportunity to pull all of those together to discuss those so that when we write a report, we are able to indicate what the next steps of this initiative should be. So we need concrete suggestions that will form part of our next steps. And if we did that, then our symposium at the University of Johannesburg shall not have been in vain. So I really implore all of you, not just to sit and listen, but engage as robustly as possible, but take that extra step of jotting down what you would consider to be appropriate recommendations for inclusion in the final report so that when ACU and Yusuf look at these, we are able to move to the next step. So thank you very much and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, the first session will be chaired by Professor Francis Peterson from the University of Free State. Over to you, Francis. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Siswe. And uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I just want to check whether all the speakers are here for the first session. Witty Green, um, Witty, you there? Oliver, I have seen Oliver. Uh, he's over there. Aldo and Nana, both. And Sarah, Masutsa. Sarah here? Where's Sarah? Not here. There are two Sarahs, Sarah Musutsa um, from the um, National Institute of Humanities and Social Science. All right, so maybe she could come in. What I'm going to ask is that is the presentations, if you do the presentation, well, when you finish, you can probably just sit there on the, on the bench uh, in front, and then we'll work through all the presentations, and then we'll open up uh, for questions and discussions. I'm going to give each of the pre uh, uh, presenters 10 minutes. Uh, just to make sure that we at least uh, uh, got enough time for questions. So, uh, um, Witty will get 10, Oliver 10, Aldo and Nano is going to make one presentation. Uh, I think uh, Aldo is going to start off and then Nano will continue and then you will finish off. But if you can also make sure that you do that within 10 minutes and then uh, we will see by that time whether um, Sarah have joined us. So, um, as uh, uh, Dr. Masi Zela have, Mabi Zela have indicated, that uh, to the, this session focused primarily on the interventions in South Africa in relation uh, uh, um, to not only emerging researchers, but also the management component of that, and then in fact some of the uh, of the of the actual research that has been done. Uh, uh, beyond the value chain. And, and when I talk about a value chain, I think it's always important to look at these things systemically. So for me, uh, when I look at a university, I'm looking at career pathing and human capital development. And I would start off from senior uh, um, postgraduate uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to PhD, to uh, postdoctoral, uh, to uh, early career, to your emerging researchers, uh, going up into your career fellows, 
your, uh, um, your lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, and professor. And if you really are serious about career pathing and career planning, you will have actually have to look at that whole value chain of career path and see which programs are actually feeding into that so that you don't have gaps, but you also make sure that the, the programs complement one another. Uh, and, and therefore, the conversation that uh, uh, um, Sishwe have referred to earlier would become meaningful rather than a discrete intervention that come at the site. Uh, because then the discussion for me is, is incomplete because you always will come up with a suboptimal solution if you only focus on one component and you don't look at the full picture. And I'm hoping that the discussion will also take that into account. Uh, because we were yesterday, we were talking about that we've got all of these programs already in the system. It is about the ineffectiveness of making sure that they yield the outcome. So it's not reinventing the wheel, it's actually trying to see to what extent we can make that more effective. And you can only do that if you stand back and you look at the, at the, at the full picture of development. Uh, it's a, a comment that, um, that was made uh, earlier uh, by my colleague from Wirtz yesterday that indicated that when we talk about researchers and emerging researchers, we must never actually disconnect it from the fact that you're actually producing to a certain extent also an academic. And therefore, the balance needs to be, be kept in mind. And that's the reason why that, that complete value chain is for me so important, that you don't uh, um, have a disconnected discussion uh, when you engage on these issues. So I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Witty Green, who is the Chief Director of the University of Education and the Department of Education and Training, to come and talk primarily at our University Capacity Development Grant, which we all know is a combination of your Research Development Grant and the Teaching Development Grant uh, for this year. And it's also going to touch on the, the NGAP, the next generation of, of academics. So, Witty, if, uh, if you could come to the podium. Thank you very much, Francis, and good um, morning, colleagues. Really great to be here. Um, my presentation today is on the University Capacity Development Program which is an umbrella program that the Department of Education and Training is implementing um, to um, focus on various areas of development within the university education sector. I'm hoping someone's gonna drive the presentation. Okay, so the University Capacity Development Program essentially is about transformation. It's a vehicle that's been put in place to assist with transformation of the university sector, focused very much on a transforming in terms of teaching, learning, researching, and leading. Um, the concept behind the uh, University Capacity Development Program is described in a ministerial statement that was published in 2017 um, on uh, the implementation of the UCDP through effective implementation, through effective management of the University Capacity Development Grant. Um, it's quite a comprehensive program, and I think understanding of it is not yet full in the system. It is the first year of implementation, and that is to be expected. I'm going to have to speed present here. I've had speed dating. It's going to be a, a quick presentation. I'm going to flash through a few slides. Okay? So in a nutshell, that's what the University Capacity Development Program is about. It's about bringing together the research development grant, the teaching development grant, and creating a new grant called the University Capacity Development Grant but the University Capacity Development Grant to implement and drive the University Capacity Development Program, which um, those three gears um, articulate what it's about. It's about student development and student success, program development, curriculum development, and staff development. And the area of staff development is really our focus here today. Um, staff development, including the development of academics as teachers and as researchers. So a kind of holistic approach to, to um, staff development. Um, the University Capacity Development Grant is one source, one resource that is used for the UCDP. A number of other resources come to bear, including other funding that we're able to generate through partnerships with other government departments, with university contributions, and with a whole range of philanthropies and foundations that are starting to come on board. 
So essentially gearing the, gearing the system for success is what we're trying um, to drive through the UCDP, okay? So there's the UCDP. It is about student development, about staff development, about program development. If you look at the middle one today, staff development, we're driving the staff development through the Staffing South Africa's Universities Framework at the South. This is what the South is about. Essentially, it's about implementing five programs at the national level and one cross-cutting program at the institutional level. Now, Francis uh, stole a little bit of the thunder of the UCDP in the, in the introduction. It is about looking at the entire career path pipeline of an academic, moving from recruitment right to the point of retirement and dealing with higher education leadership and management. So the five programs are the Nurturing Emerging Scholars Program, the New Generation of Academics Program, the University Staff Doctoral Program, the Future Professors Program, and the Higher Education Leadership and Management Program. I'm not gonna be able to uh, explain all of those in detail now given the time. The NGAP is the one that's most known and most visible in the system because we started implementing it from 2015. We've just started implementing the others, and I'm gonna flip through that quite quickly. Right? The cross-cutting program is what we refer to as the Staffing South African Universities Framework Development Program, and it's implemented at institutional level, and it represents the collection of activities that institutions are implementing using their UCDGs at the institutional level. So things like supervision development, things like writing workshops, things like research courses, a whole range of things are happening at the institutional level that complement the national programs. <clears throat> okay, so the Nurture, Nurturing Emerging Scholars Program, its conceptualization, conceptualization is currently underway. It's meant to be a feeder program into the NGAP. It's, uh, we, we're thinking about something like an academic internship, providing a substantial scholarship for an academic internship that allows people to be put into intern posts in universities that enable them to do honors or masters um, in an environment that supports them quite strongly and that starts to develop them as academics, right? And that leads then as a feeder program into the NGAP. We are seeing that some institutions are struggling to recruit NGAP posts, particularly in the critical subjects, um, and uh, are asking us, can they appoint people with honors and so on. And so we think that in order to keep the status of the NGAP where it is, we rather create this feeder program that feeds into the NGAP, right? We are hoping to implement this this year through a pilot program uh, with the French embassy. Um, and we will be talking to universities around this. So we haven't tested a concept with universities yet. Um, the next step will be to call the relevant people together and to help to unpack this concept in more detail for us. Um, the new generation of academics program. Um, so every, if each one of these programs, you'll see three key things coming through them. The idea of mentorship right, is a strong theme. The idea of doing a qualification at an appropriate level is a strong theme. And the idea of international experience is a strong theme, both through all the programs, right? So the new generation of academics program is about employing new staff, new academics, right from the outset in permanent posts at universities and supporting them on a six year program towards becoming fully embedded as an academic in the system. And so you can see some features, permanent employment, studying for a master's, a PhD or a postdoc, mentoring, courses on research and teaching development, international mobility, and support for research through infrastructure and equipment. Um, the investment in the NGAP is about 2.5 million per NGAP recruit over the six year period. And it works on a sliding scale with the universities coming on board in the latter part of the six years through contribution to the salary costs. Okay, the NGAP stats to date, you can see, um, we've allocated 473 posts so far, up to phase five, which is just being finalized now. Universities will get their letters. Basically, everyone will probably get what they asked for if it was less than five. Um, the number of posts that are filled in the system is 326, and we have an investment of over 1.1 billion invested in NGAP over uh, the, the four years that has been, the five years that has been implemented. You can see the, the demographics in the NGAP. It is starting to contribute and it is making a difference in terms of 
transformation. So you can see 80% of um, the appointees are black African, um, and you can see 58% of the appointees are female um, in the NGAP. University staff doctoral program is the next after the NGAP. It's about targeting the existing academics in the institutions and supporting them to get doctoral degrees. Um, the idea is it happens through a tripartite partnership, a South African university, two, uh, um, two or more South African universities, one of which must be an HDI or University of Technology and a university abroad um, in, in a country that you've managed to establish a partnership with. Um, it's for South African academics, permanent uh, instructional research staff, um, and you can see some of the targets there, right? The investment is about 500,000 per scholar. Um, you can see the phase-wise phase implementation of the U University staff doctoral program. Phase one was with the uh, uh, uni uh, United States partnership, underway already, 144 doc doctoral students being supported. Phase two is just about being initiated through a UK partnership. Um, our colleague from the uh, British Council yesterday indicated the investment that the uh, British Council through the Newton Fund is coming on board with. We are going to be, uh, uh, with that investment and the DHET mirroring that, um, able to uh, recruit between 150 and 200 staff doctorates um, over the next year in that program. Phase three is a partnership with Altasa. Phase four is a partnership with Saturn focused on the University of Technology. And phase five is likely a partnership with BRICS. Um, all of these being initiated in this next year. The Future Professors Program, phase one involved the appointment of six research chairs in post-school education and training. Um, so he has focused on the next, the next stage, the professoriate, growing the professoriate. Um, phase two is gonna be initiated this year. Um, uh, it involves a partnership with the University of Stellenbosch. It will be led by Professor Jansen, and it will involve the recruitment of 25 high achieving senior lecturers or lecturers who are nearly moving towards a professor position and helping them on that pathway, right? Um, it will be three, three cohorts of 25 recruited over the next years, and you'll get a call for that quite soon. An investment of about uh, 65 million uh, in that program over the next, next three years. The Higher Le Education Leadership and Management Program is the next formal program along the pipeline. Um, Oliver will talk to this. Um, it's a partnership with USAF. Um, so essentially we're saying the UCDP is about moving from this kind of shotgun approach that you've had previously, just kind of willy-nilly uh, uh, initiatives being implemented, um, to creating a pipeline, creating a coherent uh, uh, response, um, flying in formation, basically. Um, all of us working together in the same direction positioning the UCDP as an umbrella program that we can garner support for along these five important programs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Witty. I think you, stick to, you actually stuck to the time, uh, almost 10 minutes on the dot. So I'm going to call Oliver Seal, who's the program director of the High Education Leadership and Management Program. And so Oliver, you also got 10 minutes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Are you there? Great. It's a wonderful day in, in Gauteng, in the University of Johannesburg. I've been here a number of times, and I just discover new things every time and I'm here. And I've discovered this new venue, um, which has got an amazing view uh, over Johannesburg. So it's good to be here. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm going to just talk to you briefly uh, about the Helm program. Um, I guess I use the tool here. Okay. Um, Helm, it's not a new program at USAF, at University of South Africa. It was established in early 2000 with the former HESA, Higher Education South Africa. And um, it kept going for some time, but then ran out of steam and, of course, out of funding. And we've been talking to the DHET as a strategic partner of this program for some time. And fortunately, about two, three years ago, DHET came on board as our partner in this. So we're very excited about the, the, the future of Helm. We talk about revitalizing the program and repositioning it. 
What we're presenting here is one of the two, or two, two things that, that, that came out of the first evaluation of, the, of HAL 1 uh, from the external evaluation reports. One was that there was not a strategic integrated approach to leadership development in universities, that what we were doing was very episodic and at a piecemeal. The other was that we didn't really have a very strong curriculum framework. We've developed this, what's called MOLD, Manage Organizational Leadership Development, which underpins uh, all we do within HELM, and that's our theory of change. Essentially, what the model argues for is instead of us plugging on performance, uh, onto a performance management plan, or performance management, what we call your personal development plan, we argue, we flip the model, and we say that leadership development drives performance and career management. I think Francis mentioned that the emphasis is on managing people's careers within the university. It's a systems-based approach, which essentially looks at the input level, the leadership context, which is global, national, organizational, institutional space, and the individual, what they bring to the position when they are appointed. That's at an input level, and we call that the leadership context. Leadership capacity then talks to what we need to do in terms of process to assist someone that's been newly appointed or in a position to improve their performance or take them to the next level of performance. Often we measure these uh, with frameworks and competencies and we realize that it's more than this. For instance, my own uh, PhD research was on leadership development for deans. Very interesting to see how people understand their roles and what they ultimately end up doing within university. Skills development and critically important this idea of reflection and learning. Most of us in this room spend 16, 18 hour days in our university spaces, but we don't step back or step out to reflect on what we're doing and how we can do it better and build that time for reflection and learning into our own personal development plans and programs. That's on the process side. And then um, on the outputs outcome side, we've got four types of capitals that's collective called leadership capital. Um, often or more often than not, your leadership development initiatives are measured in two ways. Uh, human capital, what new skills and knowledge have you acquired? The other is economic capital. For instance, you've invested 10,000 Rand in a grant writing uh, workshop for someone. The person comes, uh, uses the skill, develops a grant, gets 1 million Rand in terms of funding for their particular project. That's a really good return. 10,000 Rand investment, a million Rand return. That's economic capital. The other two that haven't really been, been, been measured in uh, leadership development initiatives, organizational capital, it's policies, processes you put in place, so God forbid something happens to you, life goes on with your university because you've transferred that knowledge into an organizational space or place. The fourth uh, capital there, which is becoming more popular um, nowadays, is the notion of social capital, not what you know, but who you know, building people's uh, individual social capital within the institution and then also outside of the universities. Those four capitals um, then combine to form the leadership capital. We argue in this model that everyone has potential for leadership. So the sooner you start looking and finding the potential and building on it, the better. Then your leadership development plan plugs into your performance and as I mentioned, into your career management. What we do here in terms of, of, of the way we've, we've, we've staged the HELM process, we've started now as I speak, uh, we have about 60 heads of schools and heads of academic departments at a program um, just uh, north of here in Centurion. Um, that's the HELM Heads of uh, Schools and Academic Departments program. Um, that's the foundation program and it doubles up as a macro induction for someone who has been appointed in the position I discovered in my own research a number of the deans that were appointed, very critical bridge building position. Most of them didn't even have an induction. They were just given the keys to the office, the phone rang and somebody said, hello, Dean. And that was the beginning of the end, as one of them, as one of them said. Then we have the thematic and specialist program. So what we've done here, for instance, last year, we ran a workshop on research integrity. So we take specialist functions like research managers. Remember, Helm is focusing on the leadership and the management dimension and not at practitioner level. So we build the capacity of the leadership and the management to give effect to some of the projects and operations within university. Then we, we're looking at equity programs. Uh, we are in the process of developing, uh, uh, designing a women in leadership program. Um, we will put that in place later on in the second semester. And also a dean's program. We realize the most important with respect to vice chancellors the most important job in the university is not the vice chancellor, it's the dean. That's where the academy and the administration interfaces. That's the heart 
of the academic project. So we need to ensure that we have the right people in place and they know what they need to do in that critical bridge building position. Um, we're also putting in place a postgraduate diploma. Um, it doesn't exist. A postgraduate diploma in higher education leadership and management. For those people who have a, a, a first degree in their discipline and want to dabble in this management stuff, university management, not business management, university management will then can do the postgraduate diploma. You could also then complete the modules for non-credential purposes. And then we have retreats and mentorships with the vice chancellors and other executives. The most difficult group, the vice chancellors, we're not sure what to do with them because they know everything. They're all knowing and all seeing next to God, but we'll find a way to work with them. We're looking at specific retreats uh, for the vice chancellors. I don't know if, if you know that in the last two years, we had a 50% turnover in our vice chancellors. So there's almost 30 new vice chancellors in the last two years in our system. And we really need to work with them, and that's the future of our, of our university system. Just to give you a quick uh, sense of what the Foundations of Leadership program looks like, it's a, it's a four day program, two days in the first semester, two days in the second semester, and we cover things like the university mission, policy funding, uh, look at academic leadership in particular, planning, operations, and people management. So the first part we're doing now, for example, and the, the second part we will do in the second semester, and those for the different levels of leadership and management. This just gives you a sense of what our, our programs and, and, and courses look like, and there's some more I talked about, the, those programs, and, and I think finally, the importance around partnerships and collaborations. I think we've realized that this is a national project. We must get away from this idea of competing as universities. I mean, uh, we, we, we really just set ourselves up for failure in some instances because we're not working collaboratively. We have decided within USAF to use Helm as a vehicle for partnerships in universities. So, for universities, by universities, we are not using consultants who claim to know our sector and tell us all about their processes and stuff. Uh, where universities, for example, have an in-house program, we will take that, enhance it, and take it to scale. Also, a very strong focus on benchmarking and what's happening globally, good practice internationally. Um, I'll be visiting some, some organizations in the UK and the US to go and talk about collaborations with them later on in the year. And then I talked about the deep dives, deep dives for women in leadership and for deans, and we're including in that an international learning experience because we want to lift people out of the, the current situation that we need to focus on the future and expose them to other uh, university systems. And we're moving towards, we're already talking in USAF about a Pan-African University Leadership Academy, it doesn't exist. Uh, we will work on that through strategic alliances. Again, it will be in partnership uh, with regional organizations, with, with pan-African organizations, and Helm is the foundation um, of that future. Thank you very much. I think you have uh, brought up some, some time. Your, your presentation was much shorter than 10 minutes, but we will get back on the question time. Um, I did, I just want to double check, but I heard that uh, Prof. Sarah Musitz, Musutsa is not here, and I just want to double check whether she hasn't slipped in while we were talking. All right, so I just want to confirm that. So I'll do, you and Nanu is then over, and, and uh, we can give you about 12 minutes or so. Knowing the NRF will probably take longer, right? Colleagues, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce my senior colleague, uh, Dr. Nana Buadu. He is the chair, or he's the director for the research chairs component at the NRF, falling within the research chairs and centers of excellence. <coughs> Before we start, you are very well aware of this instrument called research chairs. There is a change currently in process to contextualize many of the aspects that we uh, have been discussing since yesterday. I think what Francis has said in his opening remarks on career pathing and human capital development, this is the intent of the discussions that we're having, and this certainly is the sea change that is necessary to take a long view in terms of how we invest and where we invest. The second opening remark certainly is contextualized by the presentation that Witte has done. Really a whole of system or ecosystem systemic type of approach to address the challenges that we have 
within a small system, doing more with the same budget for that matter. Those are the challenges that we are engaged with. So a massive program that we have learned from internationally and that has been established like the South African Research Chairs Initiative and the one that I'll speak about, the Oartambo Africa Research Chairs. Those are the type of investments that we're looking for to engage in a whole of system, eco system type of approach. So uh, Nana will do the first part, uh, not an overview of the chairs, but perhaps speaking a little bit more on its evolution and especially the innovation that has been brought with private sector, with industry, with other types of partners, bilateral for instance, that implies a non-usual type of research chair environment. And the very unusual research chairs environment of our Tambo is what I'll focus on. So Nana, please. Thank for the introduction. I think I'm just going to get straight to it because a lot of the people in the room are already very au fait with the Saatchi program and what it's all about. Um, but I'll just start off by basically just trying to introduce to everyone the reasons why I think the Saatchi was established in the first place. There are several, there are several <laughs> national um, you know, drivers that informed the creation of um, Saatchi. And some of these were the thematic departmental strategies um, the SDGs as well, which was currently brought in, and also now with what Eldo was saying as well with the OR Tambo um, researchers, we're trying to see how we can get into the African space and try and um, broaden Saatchi beyond just the South African context. Um, Saatchi, again, in, in the strategic context, is a, a government initiative that was uh, um, established by the uh, Department of uh, Science and Technology and implemented by the National Research Foundation. Now, the aim was to strengthen research capacity and innovation, but also to address the brain drain, which I think we've done very well in doing, and um, also to transform the national system of innovation. Now, that's a bit of a challenge, and I think we are still uh, battling along with that, but we'll come, we'll come right someday. Um, also, to position the South African um, economy in, in a, as a knowledge-based economy, but also then to attract and retain world-class um, researchers into the country. But Saatchi was also then modeled around what we call international best practices, because we didn't just pick it up from anywhere. It was modeled around the Canadian researchers as the example, and basically um, we try and um, attain to that benchmark. Now, there are several um, types of researchers that we currently have. Now, in here, we, um, I'm going to speak about three types, but we have um, four types, actually five types, including the OR Tambo um, researchers. The first type is what we call your classic Saatchi chairs. Now these are basically research-based um, uh, uh, research chairs with a focus mainly on advancement of knowledge frontiers and um, research capacity development. We also have what we call our R&D chairs, which are more of our first trend uh, mathematics research chairs. These chairs have got a, a strong leaning towards the development of learning interventions and evidence-based um, interventions um, in terms of the research uh, space. We also have what we call our bilateral researchers. These are our international researchers, and they are basically with, they have a focus on international and global uh, priority areas. Now, there are several of these, and now the fourth one that is not in the diagram is what we've now recently been approved as the university um, co-funding or the endowed um, researchers. Now, the idea behind that is to try and advance transformation for those universities who've got you know, candidates who can meet the requirements of the co-funding. Now, the co-funding model works in the sense that it's a 50-50 partnership with the NRF, and it's only in priority areas that will advance the university's research agenda. So meaning that um, if you have any, any um, black female researchers, we prioritize those in the co-funding to try and advance the the transformation agenda. But this co-funding is only open to willing um, institutions who are willing to partner with the NRF to, um, uh, for, to help us achieve you know, the transformation agenda. And I think Eldo will tell you a bit more about the OR Tambo researchers later in this presentation. But just to give you an idea of the Saatchi objectives, I'm not gonna run through everything, but I think what is important on this slide is that the main goal of Saatchi is to strengthen and improve the research and innovation capacity of universities 
to produce high quality postgraduate uh, students and research and innovation outputs. And that is very key in the whole focus of Saatchi. It's not just about um, funding researchers. And I think the other um, element that doesn't come through very strongly is that as much as Saatchi is awarded or hosted by a particular institution, Saatchi it should be looked at as a national asset, not just as an institutional asset. What we're trying to do is that we're trying to encourage researchers or chairs to train students beyond, beyond their own um, institutions. Meaning if you are awarded a Saatchi chair at UJ and you are training students elsewhere, that, that um, does very well for your, um, your review. But I mean, the, the focus here is to make sure that Saatchi is seen as a national asset and not just as an institutional asset. And I think just to carry on with some of the guiding principles, universities bid in, a, uh, in an open competitive process for open calls. But for the university co-founder chairs, these chairs are primarily um, awarded to universities that can co-fund. So that there's a different uh, memorandum of agreement that we normally sit and discuss with the different universities that are interested. And again, like I said, is to advance the university's research areas that they feel have got, um, they've got capacity and that they need development in. But chairs are also expected to spend at least 80% of their time training and not lecturing, but training the next generation um, researchers. And just to carry on as well, I think the transformation agenda I've already mentioned. Um, we, um, also now, uh, there's a strong preference towards the inclusion of historically um, disadvantaged or historically disadvantaged um, uh, institutions. And also um, universities with less than 15 chairs are also now being prioritized because a lot of the universities already have a lot of chairs. And I think some of the ones that are not participating, we're trying to bring them on board as well. And I think um, the rest of it is pretty much, so basically the success of the instrument has also seen a lot of um, international and uh, national co uh, collaborations and partnerships. We've got several of these examples with um, the DHEAD chairs in PSET. We've got six chairs in that area that are looking in, into the education space. We also have the first round mathematics chairs. I think this was the first classic partnering in the Saatchi model where a, a private sector came in to try and see how we can advance the objectives of the, of the mathematics, especially the teaching aspect of the mathematics in the schools. And then we also have the SAMRC chair looking in biostatistics at the um, University of Pretoria. We have the Sugar Milling Research um, Institute has also come on board with us and established two chairs in the area of um, uh, sugarcane biorefinery and energy. We also have our net bank chairs We've got the Saimi chair. It's not actually a chair. The Saimi chair, we couldn't find anybody in the oceans economy that was suitable as a chair. And we've decided to turn that into what we call a community of practice, which I didn't mention here, but that's also another type of um, initiative that looks more at um, policy and looks more at uh, you know, policy interventions that um, can be uh, put in place. And then we've got our bilateral research chairs. We also have several chairs with the national, um, with the national facilities. And this is a, a new initiative that we put together. We also have several bilateral chairs with the UK, with Namibia, and also we've got trilateral chairs with Canada and the UK as well. And I think um, I will then hand over to Eldo to give you a, a, a broader context in terms of the um, four Tambo chairs. And I thank you. Colleagues, for those of you who do not know, it is a very large national program, and I'm saying this specifically for our visitors. It has settled or stabilized around 240 chairs at any given time. The return on investment on these is really massive. Um, Wim and Hester, I think the one in the broad viticulture field at your university has literally raised hundreds of millions of rands for that industry. One of the other institutions in the broad, broad flower production environment has had a direct impact in increasing the effectiveness and quality of flower production in South Africa, et cetera. So this is a broad notion that the country, with the NRF's assistance, uh, will continue with. Taking that process further is the new notion of the OR Tambo Africa Research Chairs. If some of you can remember, Minister Pando, in her previous capacity, announced this intention at South Africa Science Forum in 2016, uh, in 2017. 
And we immediately engaged with the partnership of the OR Tambo Foundation to start establishing this notion of funding outside of South Africa, number one, in partnership with South African institutions. Number two, looking at the Africa landscape and how to invest more effectively for this co-production, co-investment process on the continent. Number three, the IDRC, the International Development Research Center of Canada, which has been also very instrumental in the Science Granting Council initiative that you will also be aware of, working with 15 other NRFs or Science Granting Councils on the continent in a five-year program, 15 countries, to strengthen the capacity of science granting uh, in Africa. The IDRC has been very willing to co-invest in this program of nearly 160 million rand by providing 30% of the engagement. Small percentage from the Awar Tambo Foundation and the majority of that from the NRF. There's two basic tenets that this is focused on. One is the notion of investment in excellence. It's a core aspect of the notion of research chairs and excellent research. This continues with the OR Tambo Africa research chairs. So we've considered the role and focus of research on the continent, a great increase that has, is very notable over the past 10 years. True basis to engage this through effective collaboration partnerships. There's many models and examples of previous success, either through the World Bank or other donors or other development partners, of focused research areas or programs that could also be regarded as chairs, but that has been successful in that regionality to bring excellence on board. The second key basis is our engagement in Africa. South Africa has been very successful uh, over the past decades with that engagement. Many of the universities represented here, others who's not here has been very successful, some have not been. But this is a very basic engagement, nationally speaking, that the NRF has also taken up in terms of where it invests and how, but perhaps more importantly, is how we engage. We call this, and there's many others, a matrix of country investment. There's many, many initiatives, colleagues, and networks currently in play on the continent. The four that we've used as guides or to determine the intersections of countries of where to invest is primarily the Science Granting Council's initiative. You're very well aware of the African Research Universities Alliance the Strengthening Higher Agricultural Education Africa Initiative by the World Bank. The NRF is very involved in this. It's a $300 million investment in the next 10 years with selected universities for regional development on the continent. And of course, the program that's settled by the African Academy of Sciences called the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa. We've had many discussions with UKRI, the UK equivalent of the NRF, other old players, IDRC, as I've mentioned. And we look at the continent holistically and really determine where we can be effective but strategic in how and where we invest. The aim of these chairs, 10 of which will be funded for the next five years, and that will be increased based on funding but also in terms of success, is that it builds and leverages, of course, on existing continental areas of excellence and our networks. As with the Saatchi chairs, this, but truly from a continental perspective, focuses on institutional capacity development, high-end skills, recruitment and retention of excellent researchers, and incentives to support research that contributes to socioeconomic and transformative development. We are in this for the long haul. There's a long-term view based on immediate phases of investment. But with you, with many other partners, with the ACU we've had discussions, for instance, we see this as a program for the future. There's a few guiding principles which are very similar to those of Saatchi, but perhaps slightly more tweaked for this African perspective. So the 10 chairs will be funded wholly outside of South Africa and will be held by an African public research intensive university. It is expected that there's national partnerships, 
in support of this ecosystem that forms the chair, but similarly also, and many of your universities is in the process or has applied, the closing date has just passed, as strategic international partners uh, for these chairs. It is open and very competitive, two-phased process, institutional uh, in expressions of interest, and then of course the science proposals of those who's invited to uh, apply for that. As we've mentioned, we want to focus these in the matrix of both the Arua countries and the Science Granting Council initiative countries. So there's 15 countries that will be the spread to choose from. Focus on research, focused on international competitiveness and high level human capital development. What makes this different is that from the onset, we will target 60% female shareholders and up to 40% in the social sciences and humanities in the awarding of these chairs. Principal tenet for selection is that they must be collaborative in nature. And thirdly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, that the focus will remain and will try to increase this notion of excellence um, in research and capacity development. That, colleagues, briefly, is this new initiative that, number one, fits within the broad framework of the NRF's investment horizon, but more importantly, fits within the broad framework of the investment horizon that many of you, and especially our partners, are making on the continent. It is exciting, it is completely a new approach. It's very innovative, we think, and certainly the reaction thus far from our partners, from many of your institutions who form part of the consortium for application has been very excited to participate in this. So we look forward to, to talk about this a little further. NANA's program, of course, is running this. Strategic Partnerships has engaged and de developed the initial approach and, of course, the funding environment. And we look forward to other initiatives that will fit into this notion that we've been discussing to really uh, take our common challenge forward. Thank you, Francis. I'm going to ask uh, both of you can probably sit there. Uh, Nana, you can also come to the front. And uh, um, so, so the, the the sort of three areas that we that we uh, talked about this morning was more on the staff development, uh, the UCDP, uh, um, the 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 focus on uh, higher education leadership and management, and then obviously more on on research and building uh, research excellence through different types of research chairs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up for questions now. Uh, we've got about, i say, 10, uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions, comments, uh, any challenges that you would like to put forward to them. Uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is we, before we move into the, um, the next session, I'll give us all a two-minute leg stretch because uh, it's all about blood flow uh, and uh, so that we don't just just uh, run directly into the next session. So uh, can, uh, can I get an indication by hand, those who would like to ask, uh, to ask some questions? We could drop over there, go on over there, uh, there and here. All right, let me take those four questions for the first round. Is there, is there a roving mic? Is there a mic? Uh, okay, where's the mic? Have you got the mic already? Okay, then you can, you can start. I'm Shireen Watala from the Postgraduate School. And all these presentations today were really exciting. Um, I particularly enjoyed uh, Witty's presentation because it really addressed the issue of systemic change and addressing transformation. I think my question to you is how the distribution of resources and funding will happen. Uh, is it going to happen uh, through a differentiated approach in terms of the needs of the system? Is it going to be a merit-driven approach in terms of the quality of the applications coming in, or an equity-driven approach in terms of uh, you know, who should get what share of the, of the funding? Thanks very much. Thank you. Just a 
I think it's of and any of our directors are acting from hard Thank you very much. Um, uh, Aldo, you mentioned 15 countries. We would like to see the names of those countries. And then um, for Nana, I recall that when we went to Canada to study their research chair systems, you know, we had mentioned, I mean, we had looked into industrial chairs. And up till now, we keep hearing industrial chairs, but they are not really in place in South Africa. And one of the suggestions we had advanced way back in um, 2010 was for the industrial chairs, you know, to really become fully operational also in South Africa. And then what is equally painful to us in the chairs executing their tasks, you know, is the fact that their focus is on other, um, I mean, historically advanced universities and us, the historically disadvantaged universities, we continue to remain in the dark. We've got few chairs quite okay, but these other chairs that are in existence, they tend to want to collaborate more with institutions that are already advanced, either here in South Africa or elsewhere in the world than to us, which are in a historically disadvantaged universities. And we deserve to benefit from their presence as well. And for Olivier, please, um, I'm not sure if you are aware of uh, the Pan-African University concept. You know, your idea of uh, Pan-African University Leadership Academy, you could see how it can be tied to that. Thank you. Good morning, um, Rob here. Um, thank you for all the, the, the presentations. They were exciting, I agree. Um, my, my one concern, though, is in our desperation and commitment to improve our system and develop the next generation of academics, we all come up with, ah, oh, a new program, oh, another new program, ah, oh, another new program. And our limited resources get split, spread amongst the, 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 the many, many uh, programs. So, you know, we have some existing programs that are excellent. Please let us just think about just putting more money into them rather de than developing another slightly changed program. Um, because each new program adds more, uh, uh, in, in a sense, inefficiency because we have to do peer review for that, we have to have administration for that, and all that costs money. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Francis. Um, and maybe just to respond to Shireen. Um, so uh, the UCDP has an institutional allocation and then an allocation that works at the national level to drive national programs. The institutional allocation works on a model, um, a shared distribution model that really takes um, uh, institutional context into account. So for example, um, really, it's a very basic share model that works on PhDs, so the number of staff that have PhDs at the institution as a proxy for staff development needs, and the number of historically disadvantaged students at an institution as a proxy for student development needs, given the data that sh still shows that those are quite key um, factors that are, are, are kind of influencing, influencing development needs at the institution. The other programs at the national level our intention is to try and have as full participation as possible across the system. So the end gap, for example, everyone participates. But what's happening historically as the program starts to mature is that performance patterns start to impact on distribution. So for example, if you're not efficient at your institution in utilizing previous allocations, it impacts on future allocations. Um, the New Future Professors Program We'd like all 26 universities to participate, but it will be merit-based in relation to meeting certain criteria 
to participate at the prof professor level. So a whole range of mechanisms. But I think key is we'd like as full participation as possible across the system. Thank you very much. So please uh, simply Google SGCI or SGCIAfrica.org. The 15 countries are well represented for West, East and Southern. And uh, the decision on those before we even became engaged with the SGCI was also informed by where the strategic concentration of South Africa's bilaterals on the continent has historically been. I must say tongue in the cheek that if you as a South African university who stands a chance to partner with one of the applicants um, are not aware of this, it's a pity. And by that virtue, you would have seen what the SGCI countries are. <clears throat> and excuse me for, for being frank, because this also links to, to what uh, Rob has said. So, so firstly, I cannot agree more. And this is the same comment that Adam made yesterday. Our system is simply too small for individualism to uh, be the overriding factor. Yes, excellence, market environment, a competitive environment, that must be the case. But there are many examples where we can rather coordinate in a line for greater impact than yet again establish a new program. And that very much, colleagues, is based on not so much your tag as HDI or HAI, yes, it's fundamental. But it's the leadership's realization of investment in systems that are necessary to compete, like in a research office, like in a pro uh, postgraduate office or an international office. There's universities who have one, maybe two people that's responsible for, uh, for the whole of university research administration. It is completely unacceptable. So if you want to play, if you want to compete, there are fundamental aspects of investment that's reliant on the leadership of the universities to take further so that we can all start to compete a little bit more equally. Final aspect, and Anna will respond to the industry chairs. Yes, we agree there's a holdup. It's not so easy. We're trying to alleviate this also a little bit with a broader industry engagement strategy that the NRF would like to support. It is not a new thrip. Maybe the principles are the same. But we have seen that in terms of our investment, the increasing interest of industry to want to work with non-government partners, no offense, but there is an impression of bureaucracy, of longer processes, etc. So ANRF, a science council, it's much better placed in terms of that positioning factor to engage industry. So towards the end of the year, this will be announced. There will be a lot of engagement through USAF, through uh, RISG. Uh, Francis himself will give direct impact based on his experience, uh, input based on his experience. So there's many options on the table, colleagues. Uh, one understands that there is sometimes a little bit of a irritation, if you will, uh, many play in the same space. The coherence is very important. Something the, like the UCDP really addresses this process of coherence. So this is an opportunity for not just a national council, but for the universities, and I think most importantly, our partners to bring coherence ourselves to the system that we are all involved in. I think just to add to what Aldo is saying, is that currently now we, we've got a pilot running with um, TUT to, to try and establish a chair in industry with um, Gibela. But um, like um, Aldo is saying, there's several challenges that we go through. And one of those is, you know, mandates are different, especially at industry level. And um, the kind of um, investment that's required as well is very high in terms of um, industry chairs. But we are in the process, like Eldo is saying, of trying to establish those chairs, but it will take some time. And if you, uh, I think you had a question about task focus um, within the, the researchers. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not always easy to 
not be task focused because um, researchers are you know, established within certain research areas that require development. So in that sense, like I was saying, um, institutions then need to stop looking at such chairs as classical institutional chairs, but rather as national um, assets. In that way, we'll be able to then share broadly you know, the resources and the development of capacity throughout the country. Uh, I, I think the two parts for me, I mean, certainly this is, uh, we need the commitment, for example, of HR directors and working through the USAF HR directors forum to support HR directors to give effect to helm as partners. And also the Pan-African University model, I think the idea of going regional and collaborative is key. Uh, we, we, we're looking for strategic alliances and exploring particular models and how that's worked and where we can draw experiences from for the academy. Good morning. Um, my, f my question is just to Aldo and Nano. Um, Nana, I think um, thinking about the joint research chairs model is really important. I think um, the NRF has always tried to get institutions to work together around chairs, but um, the exact model of how that works operationally and practically has not really been well thought through. So I would like to ask you to think about that carefully. And I think also with the help of the DHET, look at models and frameworks on how um, postgraduate students can be supervised between institutions. I think the model for that is not yet clear. The subsidy formula is, it's difficult for people to, to deal with that. So in thinking of the joint research chairs and where partnerships exist, I think the model is really important. And then just a comment, um, it was really interesting for me to, to hear about the HELM project and just putting my SARIMA, the Southern African Research and Innovation Management Association hat on for the moment, I would really like to discuss um, with Oliver on how we can potentially work together. So SARIMA's focus is entirely on building research and innovation management capacity more on the level of who we have in our research offices and postgraduate offices, et cetera, dealing with um, and tech transfer offices dealing with research and innovation management. So I think there's a lot of scope there to, again, not duplicate, but to pull resources together. Thanks. Thank you to the all presenters. I just want to check with uh, Nana. W when you present around the chairs, are we likely to see more of the traditional chairs as you call them or are we moving towards that concept to the co-funding you know kind of chairs and what quantum of the chairs are you envisaging for those uh, co-funded one um, i think i'll just start with a comment on tharina i think it was more of a comment than a question but yeah we will look into several models it's just that it's not so easy to prescribe how institutions should work, but I mean, that's something we should consider, definitely. Um, but Bernard, I think in terms of the, the co-funding model, um, given that we've got um, constrained resources in terms of financial um, resources, we are looking more at the co-funding because of that, but also in addition, um, we've got a lot of chairs, because what we did is that we classified our chairs into the different educational systems and we've realized that we've got a number of traditional chairs in a lot of these areas. And I think now the focus is now more on being strategic with the sort of chairs that we are going to award going forward to make sure that they respond positively to um, you know, the developments within the country and within the institutions. Just a quick one. So I mean, colleagues, you, you've, you've clearly seen from our discussions also yesterday that the notion of innovation in partnership will be the basis of investments, I almost want to say, going forward. Funding investment, collaborative in, uh, funding partnership, collaborative partnership, um, co-direction, co-design, et cetera. And that has been a basic tenet of this new generation of chairs, if I may be bold to call them that, is, is based on, but 
I want to emphasize what Nana has said. It is very difficult to be prescriptive. I think the, the challenge is we can strengthen the capacity at the NRF to engage slightly more insightfully with suggestions that the sector comes with. And that might assist in which I think the NRF has a very open facilitative type of work environment for the universities to make their own decisions. But there's always competition. Not mentioning centers' names or chairs' names. There's many joint chairs and joint centers of excellence in the country. So one university refuses to pay their additional part. The other one feels higher because the director sits at the physical university and not at the other one. Keep in mind that there is also a little bit of infighting among the institutions while we wait for them to come with the innovation of how they want to model their participation or collaboration or how they want to bring innovation in their partnership. So it's a little bit of a two-way street. Certainly more work at the NRF is necessary, but we invite you to be open and to bring your own innovation and really the old adage is please collaborate on an equal footing. This notion of infighting of a big, one partner is bigger than the other by virtue of whatever metric, that has become slightly debilitating and, and we've seen that. It's also a constant match up and making peace process sometimes between the institutions. But the prescriptive part, we're trying to stay away with because I think the intent is to really uh, try to be facilitative, open, and entertain your innovation. It is not you and us, it is for the system. And I think what yesterday and today is clearly confirmed again is that we are the system and we determine that system's future. So bring the competitiveness, it's very important. There must be differentiation. Some are stronger than others. Some has a different focus than others, regardless of what we see as um, our, our common future, that is important. But the commonality is that we are in one system, that we have little resources, that we must do more, and that the talking happens more year by virtue of USAF or ACU than it does by your own innovation among the institutions. And all of us, I think, must take co-responsibility for that. Thank you, Aldo. Um, just in summary, you know, it, it, um, it sort of reminded me uh, many years ago when we uh, had the whole debate about the innovation chasm. And there was uh, a lot of um, uh, people from the science councils and universities that were arguing that there weren't enough funding available to fund the chasm. And what we did was to look at, uh, and it was part of NACI's role, uh, to look at mapping exactly the funding instruments across the system. And we realized that there is more than enough funding to fund the chasm. It is just the fact that the foci and the efficiency and the effectiveness of those systems to be connected wasn't there. And I uh, want to come back to the point that I made yesterday. I look at the innovation landscape as the science council, government, industry, private sector and commerce and universities. And then if you map it further and you understand the bilaterals that we have, the relationship with the universities in other parts of the world and the continent, and you unpack that further, what relationship they have with partners, and you map that, that in itself will give you more than enough space to be able to address all of the challenges that we've got. Because these are programs that are in place, there are funding mechanisms that would be in place, there are relationships that they would have with different industries. And I think that we often don't take that step back. And, and, and as you probably all probably picked up, I'm a more systems person. So I want the system to tell us. Now come back to the comment about the HR directors. If you look at career pathing at university, and you look at your, at, 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 that's the question that you ask. What you would do is you would say, well, who are the players that actually play a role in career pathing? 
It will be your research director. It will be your DVC research. It will be your HR director, your finance director. It will be the person that look after your NGAP or all of those programs. And it will be the person, the DVC, responsible for operations. That's the group that look at the pathing. Doesn't actually look at the program that is supported. Because there are very others, many other programs that are supported outside of government that also have the same, the same role. You know, there is the Mining Qualifications Authority that exactly do the same as NGAP. And I can pick probably about five or six others. So if you build your focus on the program rather than the fundamental question of career pathing, you get it actually totally wrong. Because you would never be able to map, map the complete system. So that probably is what I'm asking, and I think that is what I picked up in some of the comments that's been made. It's maybe it's time that we just take one step back. And, 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 and I'm not saying we shouldn't look at new things, because that's are important. But I also think that we probably just have to take stock what we've got and see can we make it more effective and more connective. And that is the point that, that I think has been generated out of the discussion. I think we should give them all a hand of applause for fantastic presentations. Now, I did say that we're going to have a blood flow minute, but uh, apparently what's going to happen is there's going to be a group photo that's going to be taken now. So, uh, uh, and I, I don't know where that's going to be. Is it out in the foyer? Is it right here? Okay, so you don't have to move. You just have to walk right in front. And I think somebody will ask direct us again. Thank you very much for this, this session. And immediately after that, we will, will get into the second session. Thank you.